Alright, now that we have intermolecular forces down, we can get into phase changes. And a phase change is just a change from a liquid to a solid, or a solid to a liquid, and a liquid to a gas. That, that's a phase change, a change in phase. And to start off this series, we're going to be talking about the liquid vapor equilibrium. So, meaning, we have a cup, throw some water in there. We're talking about the equilibrium between the liquid water and when it would go into the gas phase and vice versa. And for those of you who don't know, a liquid going into the gas phase is going to be evaporation or vaporiz vaporization and then the gas phase going to a liquid is going to be condensation. So to start it off, what exactly does evaporation mean or, or going changing the phase? So everybody knows in order for water to evaporate or to boil it has to be at 100 degrees Celsius. But what happens say if you take this cup of water or a cup of, wa cup of water in front of you and you were to spill it over so that all the water would fall on the desk in front of you. And then it's on the desk in front of you, just a little bit of water and you came back a week later. If you came back a week later the water would be gone it would because it would have evaporated but you know the room didn't reach 100 degrees Celsius so you wonder how did how did that water evaporate and the reason is it's not just about reaching 100 degrees Celsius so let me draw a bigger cup here okay gotta draw the big cup because we're gonna zoom in on this right here so what happens in this water right here we have all the water molecules which make up the water and what happens is that all these water molecules are vibrating they're shaking back and forth they have a certain amount of kinetic energy they're just flying around everywhere in this water it's a liquid so you know water molecules are going everywhere and at one point there's going to be say this one water molecule at the top which is just chilling right there and then another water, mole water molecule right here and this water molecule bumps into this one and since this one flying out out of the liquid when that happens right there that water molecule that was just sitting there vibrating by itself it got hit and got ejected out of the liquid that is now in the gas phase that water molecule is now a gas or water vapor okay and this can happen nearly at basically at any temperature Okay, so just say you can look at a water bottle in front of you right now. If you look at that surface, right now there's going to be water molecules. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Anyways, water molecules that are going to be vibrating at the surface, and every now and then water molecules are going to be shot out and sent into the gas phase. <clears throat> so, going back to that, that water surface that we were looking at before, that you left on your desk those water molecules the same thing is that the same thing is happening and all those water molecules are going to be shot out into the into the air and become a gas because of the constant vibration so that just kept happening until finally there was no liquid water left it all became a gas but uh, let's think about the ocean you know the same thing is happening well like say this is the ocean right here the same thing is happening at the surface of the ocean but how come all the water doesn't evaporate and then we're left with a dry big hole there with no water and the reason for that is while this is happening the water molecules are going from the liquid phase and jumping out into the gas phase the same exact thing is happening just opposite there's going to be gas water molecules that are in the air that probably just jumped out of the liquid and are going back into the liquid phase so both of these both of these transitions are going to happen water is going to be evaporating and water is going to be condensing back and forth uh, no matter what the temperature is and sooner or later the rate that the water molecules are evaporating is going to equal the rate that the water molecules are con condensing and then once that these two rates equal each other the liquid will stay constant and the water vapor and the air will stay constant and then we reach this term that's called uh, it's an equilibrium, but more specifically, a 
dynamic. So dynamic equilibrium, and that's just the exact term for that is the rate of a forward process is exactly balanced by the rate of a re reverse process. So this process, the rate of this process is equal to this process. So that's why if you have your have the ocean, all of it's not evaporating. Well, actually, it is evaporating. It's just it's also be going back from the gas into the liquid phase at the same rate. So the water volume will stay constant. So this is where we have the dynamic equilibrium. All right, so now we get into this thing. If we look at what's going on here, these water molecules are going to be pushing out, pushing the air molecules that are in here. So say you know, we have a whole bunch of molecules that are in the gas phase, a whole bunch of water molecules that are in the liquid phase. and like I said, there's going to be this this uh, vibration and going back and forth of the water molecules, and they're going to be pushing the air molecules back. So overall, this is going to cause a certain amount of pressure. And this right here with the water molecules, the liquid molecules, pushing the air molecules back, that causes a pressure which we call vapor pressure. And that's just basically that the force that the liquid molecules exert on the air molecules as they're trying to escape. So vapor pressure. Now, the vapor pressure is proportional to the amount of kinetic energy that these water molecules have. And kinetic energy is temperature. So if we were to increase the temperature, we're going to increase the vapor pressure because of what I just said. Yeah. So let me go through that again. If we increase the temperature, well, that means we're increasing the kinetic energy of these water molecules. And that means they're going to be jumping out a lot more at a higher rate. And the rate at which they jump out is proportional to the vapor pressure. So increase the temperature, we increase the vapor pressure, and therefore they're going to be pushing out more. Now say this is the air. Like say you just have an open cup in front of you again. So that air right now, what's the pressure of the air? It's going to be 1 atm. Okay? And as we continue to increase the temperature and increase the vapor pressure, soon there's going to be a point where this vapor pressure equals the pressure that the air molecules are exerting back on the liquid. And the pressure that the air molecules are exerting back is 1 atm. So as soon as vapor pressure equals 1 atm, or whatever the pressure is of the air, something happens. If it's able to push it back at the same force, that means all of these water molecules are going to be able to push the air molecules back and jump out into the air. And that's where we get to the term that you know as boiling. The boiling point. So that is the exact definition of boiling point. The boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure or the pressure that the air is pushing back on the water molecules. So if this was water, if it was at room temperature, it has a certain vapor pressure and we keep increasing the temperature, increasing the temperature, and then finally we increase the vapor pressure. You can guess what is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the water equals the atmospheric pressure. And that's the temperature that we brought up before. It's going to be 100 degrees Celsius when it boils. All right, so moving on. Now we have this other thing called, looks like this. I know your instructor wrote that and you're like, what the heck is that? This right here is called the enthalpy of vaporization or the molar heat of vaporization and all that means is if we let me draw my cup again with my water and there's one water molecule uh, let me surround it with water molecules okay so there's six water molecules this guy right here 
is going to be ejected out, is going to be sent outwards, and go from a liquid into a gas. Now you have to remember that b between all molecules, including these, there's something called intermolecular force, which you should have learned in the previous videos. So if we're going to take this guy and send him off by himself, we have to break those intermolecular forces. I mean, it's good. we have to supply with energy so that we can break those bonds apart, intermolecular bonds apart. And that's exactly what this term means. It's going to take energy to send that guy outward. So the definition of this is the energy it takes or energy required to vaporize one mole of liquid. And I paused it so I could write that out because I didn't want you guys to sit there while I was writing it. Anyways, so this is this right here is the enthalpy of vaporization. It's the energy required to vaporize one mole of liquid. And one mole is just a, a arbitrary amount. So <clears throat> and you know like I was telling you, the re you have to supply energy in order for this water molecule to be ejected out. And that's because you have to break those intermolecular forces. So the more intermolecular forces it has, the more energy you have to put into it. So therefore, the enthalpy of vaporization is going to be higher. So this is proportional to how much intermolecular forces are, how strong those intermolecular forces are. So putting this together along with the relationship between the temperature and the vapor pressure, we come to this equation. The natural log of pressure equals the negative enthalpy of vaporization divided by the gas constant times temperature plus another constant. This is called the clausius clapeyron equation. And this is a way to relate a way to relate the pressure and the temperature and the enthalpy of vaporization. So if you know the enthalpy of vaporization in a certain temperature, you can figure out the corresponding vapor pressure for that because the R and the C are a constant. Okay, so using this equation, I'm about to get way mathy here, so if you don't like math, you might want to pause the video or skip this part right here. But I think this is very important to know. So I rewrote the same exact equation all I did was put the T out here just to make it look nicer. But this right here, you can see a relationship with the slope intercept form. So there's the Y equals M, or the slope, X plus B. So once again, the natural log of the pressure is Y. The negative enthalpy of vaporization over the gas constant is the slope. And then the inverse temperature is X. And the constant is going to be the, the y-intercept. And using that, you can come up with a nice graph. It looks something like this. Yeah. Right there. So this is the natural log of pressure right here. And here's the 1 over temperature. So basically, you can vary the, the pressure or the temperature. And based on that, you can find out what the other one would be. So if we if we knew the temperature, we could find out what the vapor pressure would be. If we knew the pressure, we could find out we could find out what the uh, temperature would be. And also, just remember the slope is the the enthalpy of vaporization over the gas constant. So if we were to plot different values of the pressure and the corresponding temperature, we could find the slope. And because this is a constant, we could figure out what the enthalpy of vaporization is. So all of this is very cool. I think uh, understanding the the equilibrium between the pressure, or I'm sorry, the liquid and the the gas is, is neat understanding, especially with this dynamic equilibrium. And it sort of makes sense. So if you're in a high humidity area, that means there's a lot of water vapor in the air. That's why your sweat won't evaporate as readily as if you were somewhere else because of all of the, all of the uh, molecules that are already in the air. That's why, you know, the sweat stays on you and you get real wet, you sweat a lot, as opposed to if you're somewhere with a really low humidity and therefore all your all your sweat evaporates immediately and you get dehydrated very easily. And this is basically it right here. So that's it for this this one right here. I hope all this makes sense and uh, we'll be looking at the liquid and solid next.